Welcome to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham, led by Professor Yujin Nagasawa. We at Close to the Truth are pleased to present these discussions. Pursuing our first theme of the existence and nature of God, we focus here on Jewish philosophy, Judaism, and the God of the Hebrew Bible. Tyron Goldschmidt is a philosopher working in metaphysics, philosophy of religion, and ethics. A special interest is Jewish philosophy. He works as a software engineer and was a philosophy professor at the University of Rochester and Wake Forest University. In addition to many publications in academic journals, he is the author of four books, including Ontological Arguments, the editor of three books, including my favorite, The Puzzle of Existence, and he is series editor of Little Debates About Big Philosophies. Ty, welcome. Let's start with how you, as an analytic philosopher and as a Jew, approach Jewish themes. I um, approach Jewish themes as an analytic philosopher and as a Jew. Um, so that's one reason I'm interested in Jewish philosophy, because I'm Jewish, and Jewish philosophy, because I'm interested in philosophy. Um, there are are not a lot of people working in uh, analytic Jewish philosophy, that is philosophy done in uh, a Jewish philosophy done in an analytic style. And um, so I found my place in it. Most Jewish philosophy is more of intellectual history or continental theology, whereas I'm interested in the meaning and justification of the central principles and practices of Judaism. In Jewish history, how important have been arguments for or against the existence of God? There are arguments presented by Jewish philosophers for the existence of God. Um, not many arguments presented by religious Jewish philosophers against the existence of God. Um, because the existence of God is a central principle of Jewish religious belief. Um, and it's treated by the great medieval Jewish philosophers like Saadia, Maimonides, Crescus. Um, so the question of the existence of God and the attempt to prove or otherwise show in some sense that there is a God is present in um, Jewish philosophical work. The ontological argument for the existence of God is one of pure reason, not requiring external observations. What are the ontological arguments and the obvious objections, the uh, modal enhancements uh, more recently? You have a whole book, Ontological Arguments. Why the fascination? Well, um, it is a short book, um, <laughs> which is a good thing. Despite its uh, brevity, I am fascinated by the ontological argument. I should add, in light of your previous question, that the ontological argument hasn't really received much attention from Jewish philosophers historically. Um, the great um, religious Jewish philosophers, at least of the past, like Saadia, Maimonides, Crescus, and others, insofar as they give arguments for the existence of God, don't focus on these kind of armchair proofs for the existence of God. It has much more historical precedent in Christian philosophers. And the basic idea, though there are many versions of ontological arguments, um, is that one can, from one's armchair, um, just thinking hard enough about the concept or idea of God, reach the conclusion that God must exist. Um, one doesn't need to appeal to any empirical evidence one doesn't need to look at design in the universe or anything like that in order to see, so the argument goes, that there must be a God. As I say, there are a few versions of this argument. Um, some get quite naughty and um, um, sophistical, maybe, if I can use that word. But some versions are quite simple. Um, Descartes, for example, presents... Uh, relatively simple version of the ontological argument that runs something like this. Um, God is, by definition, a perfect being. Even if you don't think that there is a God, you understand that that's the kind of thing that God um, would have to be. Um, a perfect being, any perfect being, with its salt, 
would have to exist. So um, um, if you think about the features that make for perfection, having great power, having great knowledge, you'd add on to that list existence. You can't do very much if you don't so much of it as exist. So God being a perfect being must exist, is the conclusion. Um, that might seem like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, and it might just be that. It might be a bit of magic, a, a word game. Um, but this word game has fascinated philosophers down the ages, and it's, it's not so easy to say where it goes wrong if it does go wrong. Yeah, Every, everybody thinks it must be wrong, but there are, are, are arguments about where it goes wrong. So I find that fascinating. So in more recent times, there's been the modal ontological argument, which uh, makes it, it takes it to a little higher level. How does that work? Yes, this is quite different from the kind of argument from Descartes that I presented, though it's still regarded as an ontological argument. It is a kind of armchair proof, supposed to be, one that doesn't rely on empirical evidence. Um, the idea of the modal ontological argument is that we can get from the mere possibility of God's existence to the actual existence of God. And the idea is that anyone, even the atheist, should grant that God is so much as possible. Even the atheist who doesn't think that God as a matter of fact exists can imagine God's existing, will grant that God could have existed. Now, the idea is, the idea of the modal ontological argument is that that admission is enough to show via a few steps of reasoning that God must in fact exist. How so? Well, God is supposed to be a necessary being, a being that um, exists no matter what, a being that would have existed however else the world had differed from the way that it is. This is the idea of a necessary being as opposed to beings like us that are contingent beings, beings that um, exist but might have failed to exist and one day won't exist. So there's this idea that if God had existed, he would have been a necessary being. And add to that the idea that um, a possibly necessary being is, in fact, necessary, that what's possibly necessary um, is necessary. And, and the key to do that is the use of possible worlds. Uh, go, go through that quick. Sometimes this is spelt out in terms of possible worlds. Um, I'm sure that if I try to spell it out in possible worlds, I might have done a little bit of a better job than I, I am now. I'm getting a bit tongue-tied. But the, the idea is that there are ways the world could have been. Okay, This is essentially the idea of a possible world. And we can imagine different ways the world could have been, a world containing um, a pink rabbit here in this room, a world containing a purple rabbit in this, this room, are all ways the world could have turned out. Complete states of affairs, everything. Yes, yes. Complete ways the world could have been are described as possible worlds. Now, the idea is that there's a way the world could have been in which God exists. That's to say there's a possible world containing a God. Okay. But God has this very special feature of being a necessary being. That's to say that if there, that God would exist in every possible world. If we were to spell this out in terms of possible world, a necessary being is a being that exists in all possible worlds. In contrast to contingent beings like me and you that exist apparently in some possible worlds, but not all. Um, now, once we grant that God exists in some possible world, as well as the idea that if he exists in some possible world, he's a necessary being and thus would exist in all possible worlds, well, one of our worlds is a possible <laughs> world. So it turns out, again, as if by magic, that God exists in our world too. <laughs> so granting that God exists in some possible world. Even one, yeah, even one even possible one, world. Granting the mere possibility that God exists, that there's a way the world could have been in which God exists, and granting that God would be a necessary being um, in this other possible world, um, would seem, it would seem to follow from that that, well, God would exist in this possible world, in all, in all possible worlds, uh, and one of ours is a possible world. The actual world is a possible world. Um, so 
the argument goes, it turns out that as a matter of fact, God exists. Right. So, I mean, this is a, a, a fun thing to do. I mean, as, as I've looked at it, the, uh, the trap in it is once you grant that a necessary being is possible to exist, that's your premise. So right. before you do the deduction, you have to say it is possible for a necessary being to exist. Once you do that, you're finished. Because right. I think so. I think so. Everything else is, is derived. Uh, let's go on to the, the, the cosmological argument. There are two points, um, two crucial premises to the modal ontological argument, at least the way we've presented it. The first is that God is so much as a possible being. And the second is that if a necessary being is possible, then it actually exists. And indeed, most of the criticism of the ontological argument does fall upon that first premise. Though the second isn't uncontroversial. Um, most critics, myself included, don't think that um, skeptics should grant that first premise as easily and as quickly as proponents of the ontological argument think that they should. Let's move on to the cosmological argument for the existence of God. It looks to the universe and starts with the premise that everything that begins to exist must have a cause of its existence. You've, this is, uh, goes back a long ways, of course, but you've worked on a new version of the cosmological argument. Walk me through some of the logical steps. The um, cosmological argument that you presented is an argument from the beginning of the universe known as the Kalam cosmological argument. The idea is roughly that um, anything that begins to exist has a cause and that the universe began to exist, thus the universe has a cause and then the cause is identified with God. Now, um, there are many um, scientific and philosophical difficulties um, with this argument and with the move from cause of the universe to a God. I um, think a more promising cosmological argument is the cosmological argument from contingency, which doesn't rely so much on any scientific premise. One doesn't have to investigate whether or not the universe had a beginning and the shape of that beginning in order to appreciate the force of the cosmological argument from contingency. This argument focuses on the existence of concrete contingent stuff like me and you, um, like our universe, however old it is, right? Um, there's a question of why there is this stuff. Why is there this contingent concrete stuff? Why are there things um, like me and you at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why? Is there the stuff there is rather than some radically different kind of contingent concrete stuff? And you might understand the cosmological argument from contingency and its various versions as, present, as an answer to this question of why there is something rather than nothing. Why? Because there's a necessary being, a being that couldn't have failed to exist and has brought about um, the other contingent concrete stuff that we see around us. And my version, it, or when I write about cosmological arguments, I typically write about different versions of this cosmological argument from contingency. What's interesting about this uh, uh, approach to the cosmological argument is you're not committed to the universe having a beginning uh, because the universe could have existed if the steady state theory was accepted, which it's not. Uh, but some, like Stephen Hawking and James Hartle, talk about the a rounded beginning of, of the universe, and so it doesn't. That's really right. Happen. So you're immune uh, from uh, attacks that says the universe may have existed forever, because it would still, even if it existed in some sense forever, it would still be contingent. Exactly. I, I think that the whereas the Kalam cosmological argument is hostage to scientific discoveries and theories about the beginning of the universe in the ways you've described, the uh, cosmological argument from contingency um, needn't concern itself. Right. And, uh, it's always, and it's always good for proofs of God to, 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 to be immune from scientific discovery uh, from, from uh, ab initio, from the, from the beginning, so which, that uh, it, it's, not, it's not challenged. Uh, so very clever. 
which is not to say that it doesn't face some serious problems and objections of its own, but they're oh, of a philosophical so. and scientific nature. Alvin Plantinger, who uh, we both know, um, famously offered two dozen or so arguments for God, which we present on Closer to Truth. Uh, people can see uh, uh, Al's videos, which we are very appreciative of. Uh, you develop one of these, one of Al's arguments, the argument from natural numbers. What's the argument and how have you extended it? I, I develop it in the book and extend it by answering some objections, but I hope I wasn't too much of a disappointment. I might have been the only uh, uh, contributor to the book who concluded that the argument doesn't really work. <laughs> I hope that um, Alvin Plantinga and the editors weren't disappointed. Um, I don't think the argument works, but I think that it's, it's well worth considering and deserves further consideration. The, the basic idea is that there are numbers, right? Um, which is, is a controversial philosophical idea, but um, some people think that it's easy enough to show that there are numbers. Um, there is, there is uh, at least one um, prime number between 18 and 20, right? Everybody will grant that. Um, but once you grant that there's a prime number between 18 and 20, you, you grant that there's a prime number. Um, if there's a prime number, there's a number. Um, so it seems like you're committed, or so the argument goes, though it's rather quick, right? Um, it seems that you're committed to the existence of numbers. Um, but what are numbers? Um, this is another thorny philosophical question. Some people are inclined to think of numbers as kind of mental realities. They're ideas or concepts in our minds. Numbers aren't physical material things. You could never bump into the number seven or trip over the number 17. Um, they're, they're, the idea is that they're, they're more like things that live in our minds, but there are so many ideas and so few minds. Um, no one has the time to think of all the ideas, right? Our finite minds can't house or contain all the numbers there are. So the argument from numbers for the existence of God suggests that there's a, there must be a divine mind to house all the um, numbers and other such abstract entities and truths of mathematics and such like. It's an intriguing idea, but I didn't think that it worked. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's move on to um, uh, problems in the existence of God, and certainly the problem of evil looms large for, for everyone who believes in, in God, at least in the Abrahamic traditions, but especially considering Jewish history, uh, pogroms to the Holocaust, what have been Jewish responses to the problem of evil philosophically? Right. Jews have been the victim of much persecution and suffering, even while religiously um, um, God is supposed to be taking special care of Jewish people and guarding their history. So how does this work? There might be a special problem of evil for the Jewish tradition that. Um, adds on to the, the very heavy problem of evil that faces all religious believers, um, insofar as Jewish history is supposed to be guarded by God, and yet how much suffering it contains. Um, Jewish responses to the problem of evil do largely correspond to answers that have been given by um, Christian and Muslim and other um, philosophical and religious traditions. So, uh, and there are some special ones though. So, so on, the, on the one hand, you'll find in Jewish philosophical literature and thoughts on the problem of evil, the familiar free will theodicy, well, evil exists because of um, our abuse of free will and free will is a good thing that God would allow and so on. You'll find the familiar soul building theodicy, um, evils, um, are allowed by God because they are, they provide us for with opportunities to achieve higher order goods. You know, we can show courage and patience only in the face of adversity and, and grow as people. So there are these familiar um, theodicies, answers to the problem of evil that one sees in other religious traditions developed by Jewish philosophers and thinkers too. But there are also some 
theodicies that are a little more unique um, in Jewish philosophical tradition and that I've focused on in my writing. Um, so one finds in the Jewish mystical tradition, especially from the Middle Ages on, a doctrine of reincarnation. Now this, this idea is it not nearly as central a Jewish principle as it is to, to uh, certain Eastern and other religions, but it's definitely there. And um, Jewish mystics and philosophers make use of the idea of reincarnation to explain and make sense of the problem of evil. Uh, the, the doc, it's, it's not unconnected to the theodicies that I, I summarized a few moments ago. You can use it to extend those. So, um, for example, you might see some innocent people suffering, or you might see some people suffering and no good come out of it. But the idea of the reincarnation theodicy is that our view is narrow. There are past lives, there are future lives, and while we might think that people are innocent here, maybe in a past life, they've done something wrong that deserves the suffering. Or while it's the case that we see no good come of, the ev of, the, of their suffering in this world, it doesn't provide any opportunities, it might do so in a future life. And Jewish philosophers who introduced this idea of reincarnation try to spell out how um, uh, future lives and, and past lives in, in detail might make sense of the suffering of um, people now, either as a punishment or for the purpose of soul building and so on. Um, an even more radical idea that I've explored in recent um, more recent papers is um, drawn from um, m drawn more from um, early modern Jewish mystics, especially Hasidic thinkers, though um, there's some earlier precedent for it too. And this is the idea that um, God has a very special power over time, okay, over history. So there might be an evil in the past that isn't the result of free will, doesn't um, serve as punishment, say, doesn't serve for any soul building. What God can do is eliminate that evil by destroying that part of the timeline. God can wipe the past clean. So while the evil exists or existed in the past, in the future, it'll be the case that that evil never existed. And um, I try to, along with um, my co-author Sam Liebens, um, make sense of how and whether this is possible, how and whether it works. Yeah, and that's a fascinating idea. I've, I've, I've read the paper. Uh, I, I think it's, it's certainly possible for God to eliminate all the evidence of the evil and God to eliminate all out the memory of the evil. Uh, so there'll be no independent existence of it. But to say that you actually eliminated that past event seems seems a, uh, a rationalization too far. I know you use some <laughs> kind of hyper time and different yes. world lines and yes. all sorts of things. But it the is end quite, result, I, I don't think you get there. <laughs> it's quite wacky. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know whether I believe it or um, I don't disbelieve it. Um, yeah, it, it, even if it's even if even if your argument is true, it, it, it's it's like you create a new timeline in which that timeline, in a sense, didn't have that evil in it. But there was always the other timeline that did have it. Well, maybe not. It requires a lot of um, hard thinking about the metaphysics of time and God's powers. Um, and there are questions that it raises that I'm not so sure of. But on some days of the week, I, um, I buy into the solution to the problem of evil. It's quite unlike traditional solutions that try to either explain why God allows evil in terms of higher order goods, theodicies and such like, or solutions that suggest that God has reasons that we're not aware of 
It's quite unique, though. It interacts with these um, these traditional answers too. So it's it's a long paper, and, and and I think it's terrific. I think exploring those ideas are fascinating. I look forward to a very in depth discussion we can have on that at another time. Uh, and I certainly commend people to look up the paper and, and, well, and to read it. You know, if, if if this time isn't good enough, maybe God would wipe it out and we can have a future. <laughs> Ty, from a Jewish perspective, do all religions worship the same God? Some religions worship the same God. I don't think, uh, I don't think from a Jewish perspective, all religions worship the same God. Um, not least because some religions don't worship God at all, right? Um, there are some religions that are atheistic. Um, there are certain forms, so, so far as I understand, of Buddhism that um, don't believe in a God or anything like um, the kind of God that Jews believe in. I think that there are clear cases where certain religions don't worship the same God. Um, ancient Canaanite religions or Egyptian religions, the ancient Greeks um, did not worship the same God as the Jews. But then there are cases where it's pretty clear that religions do worship the same God. I think that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam Sikhism, other religions besides, very plausibly worship the same God. When you say very pl plausibly, then you're, you're, you're leaving yourself an out and maybe they don't. I didn't list all the possible religions that I'm out of. Um, so the very plausibly might have qualified some religions I didn't list. Though there, there might be problems and questions to raise about um, even the Abrahamic traditions that I did list. It's very clear that Jews and Muslims worship the same God. They, they both worship one God. They think very similarly about the nature of this God. Um, they have the, they get the idea of God in a similar, from a similar historical sources. Uh, Judaism influences Muslim thinking about God, and, and later on, Muslims, Muslim philosophers influence Jewish philosophers, of course. Um, so despite some differences, disagreements about what God has done in history, um, there's a lot of overlap in the idea and in the source that Jews and Muslims have about God. And the differences don't mean that they don't worship the same God. I mean, Democrats and Republicans have very big differences about, in their thoughts about Donald Trump. They see him in very different ways. Um, but they're both referring to the same person despite these disagreements. <laughs> Um, there are probably fewer disagreements between Jews and Muslims about God than there are between um, Democrats and Republicans about T Donald Trump. So plausibly, they're referring to and worshipping the same being. Similarly, when it comes to Christianity, um, it, it, Jews and Christians worship the same God. Um, there's a little complication, though. Clearly, Jews and Christians worship the same God when it comes to Jews worshiping God, Christians worshiping what they call the Father. Okay, um, but Christian Christianity has a doctrine of the Trinity, which adds a little bit of complications here, because they also believe that the Son is God. Okay, so the Father and, and the Son are separate divine persons, but the same God. Now, Jews believe in what Christians call the Father, and Clearly, they're worshipping the same being there. But Jews don't believe that the Son is God and don't worship the Son. So we might have to add a little bit of qualification over there to make sense of the Trinity. Um, but it's, it's highly plausible that Muslims, Jews, and Christians, and Sikhs and others worship the same God. Um, maybe I should say certain there if you're going to trip me up on, on plausible. There are some religions, though, where it might be plausible, but not certain, um, because they're not so closely connected in their concept of God. They don't get the concept of God in the same historical ways, and it might be a little less clear. So maybe for some religions, we should say plausibly, but not certainly. Let's move on to the traits or attributes that God possesses. Uh, how does the Jewish concept of God articulate with the perfect being God in Christianity, uh, all the omnis, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, uh, also timeless, uh, omnis, uh, 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 um, immutable, impassable. Uh, in, in other words, how does the God of the Hebrew Bible relate to the God of the philosophers, particularly in the Christian tradition? 
Well, as, as I just explained, there is a, a difference in Jewish thinking and Christian thinking about God, especially when it comes to the Trinity. Jews don't believe that. Um, but, but otherwise, Jewish, the Jewish philosophical tradition corresponds quite closely with the Christian philosophical tradition and the Muslim philosophical tradition. And of course, they influence each other. So it's not surprising that they should uh, correspond. So we have in, just as we have these scholastic classical theists that have a picture of God in the way that you've described as omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, transcendent. So too in the Jewish tradition, we have Jewish philosophers who describe God in the same way as omnipotent, omniscient, transcendent, and so on. It's very hard sometimes to tell the difference between a description that Maimonides and a description that Aquinas are giving of God. So we, we, we um, overlap in our philosophical understandings of God. And just as there are differences within Christianity between Christian philosophers about the nature of God, so too there, there are disagreements and differences between Jewish philosophers about the nature of God. And often those d differences are drawn on the same lines too. Um, and then there's the same question that Christian philosophers engage with. How does this very philosophical understanding of God fit the picture of God drawn in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, right? Um, where God might sometimes appear transcendent, but sometimes is described quite anthropomorphically. How do we understand those um, descriptions of God? Um, must they be jettisoned in light of philosophical or reinterpreted in light of philosophical discoveries? Or should our philosophical theories be jettisoned or discarded in light of um, religious principles? And Jewish philosophers engage in just the same kinds of problems here as we see in the Christian tradition too. Take impassibility where the tradition of this this uh, perfect being God is so perfect, God cannot be changed, uh, cannot be affected. Uh, we look at the Hebrew Bible and God gets angry, uh, which is exactly the opposite of impassibility. Right. So um, some Jewish philosophers are committed to the idea that God is changeless on philosophical grounds. Um, they also might find certain biblical passages um, that say that God doesn't change pretty explicitly. Um, and then we have to wonder about those passages which say that or describe God as changing, as getting angry, for example. Um, there are choices here. Uh, some, like Maimonides, will reinterpret, or I shouldn't say reinterpret, will interpret those passages in a way that's consistent with God's being changeless. So what does it mean to say that God is getting angry? It, it just means that God is acting in the world in a way that we can understand or describe or that corresponds to the kind of way that an angry person would act um, in a situation. Okay, so God is dishing out punishments and the like. Um, other philosophers, other Jewish thinkers, are more comfortable with describing God as having attributes altogether, as having um, emotional, uh, an emotional life, uh, and... Um, just as we see in Christian philosophical tradition, there's this debate to be had. How about omniscience? Um, how, how, does God know everything in, in Jewish philosophy? Uh, how can God know everything? Certainly there are passages in which it looks like God didn't know something. Like before the flood, God didn't realize how evil these people would be. That's why he had a white mouth. Um, so how do you deal with omniscience? There are passages that suggest in the Jewish tradition that suggest that God doesn't know certain things. There are also passages that suggest that God um, knows everything, right? Um, so we have passages on both sides, and then we have to under you know, understand how they could possibly be consistent. Maybe we should interpret one said in light of the other or vice versa. Maybe we should think that God doesn't know everything, and so understand those passages that describe God's or seem to describe God's knowledge of everything in a more metaphorical or some other way, or vice versa. And there are philosophical arguments, too, on both sides. There are philosophical arguments for the conclusion that God can know everything, as well as philosophical arguments for the conclusion that God can't know everything. For example, what 
the, the classic example is hu future human free choices, right? The, the philosophical puzzle is that um, um, if God knows what we're going to do in the future, we have to do it, and so we, we aren't free to do it. Um, well, there are many answers to this puzzle and ways of developing it to avoid those answers and then further answers and, and things quickly become very naughty. Um, the Jewish tradition is, you know, contains, um, has a variety of solutions to this puzzle too. And I think that the traditional answers that have been given by philosophers are ones that uh, one can, you know, in, within the Jewish tradition freely take up. I don't think one would be a heretic for being what is called an open theist, for thinking that there are some things that God can't know for sure in the future. Um, but this isn't the dominant Jewish philosophical view. The dominant view is that God is completely omniscient and does know what, um, what our, our free actions in the future will be. And so those verses that seem to describe God as learning something or ignorant in some way are interpreted otherwise. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one, one of the approaches is that God does know everything that is possible to know. Um, and, and if the future is open, then it's, it's not possible. It's a logical contradiction to say that, um, that, that God has to know that if, if, it's, if it, it, it is impossible to know. Yes, that's perfectly right. Um, and so maybe what I said wasn't exactly precise, a little bit sloppy. Um, one can hardly expect a, um, a being to do the impossible. Right? And similarly, one can't expect a being to know the impossible. So if it's in principle impossible for um, God to know um, what the future reactions of people will be, it's hardly a shortcoming on his part that he doesn't know that. And so we might still call a God who doesn't know um, what our future actions will be omniscient. God knows everything that it's possible to know. Uh, still, some, some philosophers think that omniscience encompasses more than that. And the, the majority of the Jewish tradition takes God to be omniscient in that sense or takes the possibility of knowledge to be of wider scope than the open theists typically take it to be. Is God ineffable in any way in the Jewish tradition, uh, the apophatic versus cataphatic? It seems that in, in the Jewish God is more cataphatic in, in the sense that we can know more about the Jewish God than uh, other religious traditions might look at the, the nature of God. Oh, well, um, I might disagree there. Um, not, not with the idea that we can't know the nature of God, but with the idea that the Jewish tradition is less apath apathetic than other religious traditions or religious philosophical traditions. Because the most prominent figure in the Jewish philosophical tradition is Maimonides, and it's harder to find someone who is a more radical um, devotee of apophaticism or negative theology than Maimonides. Okay. The idea of uh, over here is that we can't know what God really is like, um, what the texture of the divine reality is. Um, we can't say what God really is like or describe God's nature. Indeed, in some sense, God doesn't have a nature to be described. There are no divine attributes. Um, God is a perfectly simple and um, uh, kind of metaphysical reality that um, escapes all possible conceptual division to. Um, all we can say about God in Maimonides' picture is that um, he does certain things. God acts in this way, God acts in that way, and that God is not. Okay, that God is not weak, that God is not ignorant. This has been a very dominant and popular Jew, view in Jewish philosophical yeah. tradition. I, I think that's absolutely true with Maimonides. And that but it's, it's and not true. unanimous. It's not unanimous. There are many Jewish philosophers in the Middle Ages who think that Maimonides is wrong about this and that we can have some knowledge about the 
inner texture of the divine reality that our concepts do in a more positive way latch on to God. We'd have to look at Maimonides' arguments to see whether they work or not. And this yeah. is something I'm interested in. And, and, and that, and that I, I totally agree with that. And Maimonides does uh, exemplify an apophatic view and, and does it uh, beautifully. Uh, but in Jewish tradition, in, in, in Judaism per se, God is very personal in terms of uh, uh, interaction with human beings, co-creation. Uh, I mean, the, the broad Jewish tradition seems to be <clears throat> much more knowledgeable about the kind of personal being that God is. In some sense, what you say is consistent with apophaticism. Maimonides doesn't deny that God interacts with human beings and plays this role in history. We can describe God's actions in great detail, but we can't say much about the being that's behind those actions. Um, and yet, um, the Jewish tradition um, despite Maimonides' efforts to ex you know, make sense of it in other terms, does include, um, despite his efforts to interpret the relevant scripture and tradition in other ways, it does include um, very robust see, descriptions of God's nature and of what God is like. And other Jewish philosophers, including medieval Jewish philosophers, think that Maimonides just goes wrong here. His reasons for thinking that we can't know about the nature of God. His reasons for thinking that there are no divine attributes. His reasons for thinking that um, we can't describe um, God in very positive ways. Full flat. They don't work. And that we are entitled to describe God and we can describe God in more positive ways. And that the scriptural and, and, and other aspects of Jewish tradition that do so can be taken much more at face value than Maimonides thinks it can. Ty, let's talk about the actions of God. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions and really short answers in terms of the approach of, of Judaism. So uh, first question is, is the world created by God ex nihilo from, from nothing? Because the first verses of, of Genesis, uh, Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et Haaretz, God created the heavens and earth, and then the earth was without form and void, uh, tohu vavohu. That seems to indicate that there was stuff that God worked with, that it wasn't ex nihilo. Um, that might even be a yes or no question. Uh, <laughs> so I can answer very quickly. Yes. Um, um, most, of, most Jewish thinkers have taken the will to have been created out of nothing, um, ex nihilo, as you say. Um, some commentators leave room for God having created the world out of some sort of very fine substance. Um, and there are certainly in the Jewish mystical traditions understanding of what this might be, and even of what nothing might be when we say that God created the world out of nothing. Um, maybe it means that, maybe it means that um, there was no stuff. God said, let there be stuff, and there was stuff. Um, or maybe and some are inclined to sort of reify nothing here. Maybe nothing is a kind of dark something that God created the world out of. And one finds certain mystical speculations about how God might have done so in the Jewish tradition too. Does God create continuously? Is the theory of continuous creation a, a tenet of Judaism? This would be an easier answer to the um, previous one. Uh, almost universal yes. Uh, how does that continuous creation work? Um, I don't know how my toaster works. <laughs> well, I don't know how any creation works. The idea is that God sustains things from moment to moment, that if there were any moment at which God decided, nope, things would suddenly flicker out of existence. Um, if God as it were, removed his attention from the universe for a second, that universe would cease to exist. Jewish tradition is committed to this view. And um, this is one way of understanding continuous creation. Does God intervene in human affairs? I think Judaism would say yes, but in the process, does God violate the laws of nature or physics? Yes, I think so. Um, 
there are some Jewish philosophers that have very exotic, a very, I don't know what word to use, radical understanding of what the laws of nature might be. Um, so that God might set things up at the beginning along with the laws of nature in such a way that what we call miracles occur. Um, but all philosophers in the Jewish tradition, all religious Jews, do believe in miracles. Um, God intervenes in human history um, uh, in some sense, right? I suppose Maimonides might say that he wound the clock at the very beginning so that things played out. It's not really intervention when you have a timeless God working in that way, or we'd have to spell it out in certain terms. But yes, the, the natural order is violated according to most Jewish thinkers and according to the Jewish tradition when, for example, um, God splits the sea for the Israelites, when God um, strikes people with plagues, when God resurrects um, dead people. God, clearly, clearly these events uh, can't be understood, at least as they're described in religious texts, can't be understood in naturalistic terms. It's very unlikely that the laws of nature will have these results. Um, it's divine intervention and a violation of those laws. How does God in Judaism relate to the salvation process or eschatology um, which has uh, in Judaism maybe less of a role than in Christianity and, and other religions, but still there is. Um, what is the process by which human beings are, are saved or, or given their reward or punishment? Judaism has a quite rich picture of the afterlife and eschatology, though the details are... Um, sometimes disputed, um, including by Jewish philosophers. Um, there is the idea of an afterlife of souls. When one dies, one's soul leaves one's body. Maybe that's just a way of speaking. Okay, go on. One persists after bodily death in a certain realm. Um, there's also the idea of a resurrection at the end of time. So one's soul then returns to one's body. Well, maybe that's a way of speaking, okay. Um, one becomes physical again. And um, just the shape of these afterlife realms, okay, the world of souls, or the world to come after the resurrection, their extent what they're filled with is described in some detail in the Jewish tradition, but there are a lot of blanks too. And so it's given rise to some quite furious debates in Jewish thought about their nature. Is Judaism a universalist religion in that uh, ultimately at the end of the end of the end that everyone will be redeemed or brought to God? In the sense, I don't know. There are senses of universalism in which Judaism is universalist. There are senses in which it's quite particularist. There is a sense of universalism, a sense, I suppose, people use the word in this way, um, in which Judaism's universal insofar as Jewish tradition doesn't think that people who aren't Jewish, people who aren't born Jewish, need to um, undertake Jewish practices or convert to Judaism in order to be saved. Um, this contrasts a bit with historical, at least historical, Christian and Muslim thought, where um, it's preferable, the idea is it's preferable for most people to convert to the religion, and maybe they can't reach heaven, they can't be saved or whatnot, unless they become Christians or Muslims or something like that. Right. So we're, we're using the term universalism in, in really two senses. Yes. One sense is, uh, is, is, do you have to be my religion, the particular my religion, or can others engage? I think Judaism is universal in that sense. Right. The other sense, and where I was asking it, is, um, is, is universalism meaning that ultimately, even if there's a purgatory, a hell, or whatever else, at the end of the end of the days, 
um, that all people will be brought to God, and then there won't be anyone who will be uh, eternally punished or e eternally um, uh, eradicated. Certainly, in light of what I just said, there's not the idea that one has to be Jewish, if one's not born Jewish, in order to um, avoid hellfire. Um, does everybody at the end of the day avoid it? Well, there's a debate in Jewish tradition about whether there is a permanent and eternal hell. Um, the normative view is that there isn't. Okay. The, the majority view among Orthodox Jews is that there isn't an eternal uh, punishment after death, though there is severe punishment um, for people who've done wrong after death. It's not eternal. The Nevertheless, they're, they're also, the dominant view is also not that everybody lands in heaven at the end. I think that the majority view, the dominant view, is that some souls are annihilated. So um, most people might, uh, no people end up, the, the, the majority view, I think the normative view, is that no one ends up in hell for eternity. Not everybody ends up in heaven, either for eternity, either. There are some people whose souls are snuffed out. Um, uh, along the way. Let's move on to metaphysics and particularly the question that you and I uh, have been fascinated. Why is there anything at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? You've called it the puzzle ex of existence. John Leslie and I have called it the mystery of existence. It's the same question. What's your overview of this deep question? And, and what are the categories, very briefly, of the potential answers? Um. I might have called it the mystery of existence if you hadn't called it the mystery of existence first. <laughs> um, there are That's few... what everybody knows. Our two books were published literally within months of each other without knowing in 2013. So we ask everybody to buy both. Don't, 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 uh, they're, they're very different too. So uh, there, there are different. Um, and there are, there, there's some overlap in the kind of answers and problems they cover, of course. There are different problems and different answers that are, fall under the heading of the mystery of existence and the puzzle of existence. There's a question of why our universe exists rather than some other universe, why our universe exists rather than nothing at all. Um, there's a question about why there are contingent things, why there are concrete things, why there are material things rather than no such things. And each of these questions might be slightly different from, one, from the others. So there are different questions here, and for each of these questions, there are different answers. And some of these answers are radically different from others. So in our discussion, I think so far we've spoken about one kind of answer in our discussion of cosmological arguments from contingency. There is something rather than nothing the answer goes because there is a necessary being. There's a being that couldn't have failed to exist and a quite impressive necessary being that can bring about all the other contingent, concrete, material beings that are around us. That's one answer, but there are other answers besides. Well, what, one of the uh, objections that I find that are <clears throat> directed towards the work that we've done is that the question itself is meaningless. I reject that. How about you? I, I think I understand the question. In fact, I think there are quite a few questions that I understand. I think I understand all the questions that are listed. Why are there concrete things? Why are there contingent things? Why are there material things? Why is there a universe rather than nothing at all? I think I can define all these terms very simply and clearly. Um, so I'd ask the critic to explain which word they don't understand. The answer is they don't understand nothing, or they think we don't understand nothing because nothing, in a sense, is the wrong kind of thing to talk about, that nothing is, uh, is an impossible term to use as we use it, because there always has to be something. Well, that seems to be more of an answer to the question than a dissolution or problem with the question. <laughs> there always has to be something, right? <laughs> kind of like the answer I, I um, sketched a few moments ago. Um, but I also think that I can explain what I mean by nothing. I think I can explain what I mean by a world, if we can use this term of possible worlds, not containing any concrete beings, not containing any kind of positive contingent stuff. I think I can make sense of the words contingent, concrete, and so on, and I think I can make sense of the word not 
And putting these ingredients together, I think I can make sense of the idea of nothing. Well, I'm, I'm your supporter on that. Um, now, how we deal with the question, uh, maybe we have some disagreements, which I like to look towards. So one approach to the question, why is this something rather than nothing, uses probabilistics. Peter Van Inwagen, a good friend of both of us, uh, has used that. Uh, you like that argument. I particularly don't. So defend your position. When you say like, we, we might mean different things. I like a lot of arguments that don't work. Uh, I wouldn't like any philosophy, much philosophy at all if I had to only like arguments that work. I don't think that the probabilistic argument works. I think there are deep problems with it. The idea is that um, there are just so many ways there could have been something, right? There's the way things are. There's the way things are, but there's a pink duck in this room. There's the way things are, but there's a purple duck in this room and so on. But there is the idea goes, at most one way, there could have been nothing. You can only picture one perfectly empty scenario. Any other perfectly empty scenario, well, it looks just like that one. It is just that one. So there's so many ways there could have been something. At most one way, there could have been nothing. Don't you see? It's just so likely that there should have been something rather than nothing. What's the mystery? What's the puzzle? Um, that's the line of thought. I don't think it works. Um, but it is intriguing, and I like it in, in that sense. Yeah, oh, 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 I, I agree. And I think the key, um, the key assumption in that is that the, the a priori uh, likelihood of nothing is the exact equivalent of every single of the infinite ways of, of infinite possible worlds the way it could be. There is that assumption, and um, it's questionable. But there are a lot of other hidden assumptions at work here. Um, one thing we might question is what we even mean by a probability in this context. And sometimes by a probability, we mean something like a chance, like a physical probability, like the measure of how likely a state of affairs is to be on the scene given some prior state of affairs. But over here, there's no prior state of affairs, so we can't have something like a chance in mind. Sometimes by a probability, we mean something like a credence or an epistemic probability, the question is then, um, how likely is something given the evidence that we have? You know, is it probable that Smith committed the crimes given his fingerprints on the murder weapon? Um, and in this sense, there's no question about how you know probable our our universe is. It's as probable as can be. I mean, um, so. so what is the sense exactly of probability that's at work in this probabilistic argument? Can we flesh it out at all? There are many hidden assumptions and worries here. Another approach centers on metaphysical nihilism, the thesis that there being nothing concrete it is possible, and the subtraction argument to defend it. Uh, do you like that one? I, I sort of do. I like it in the sense that I like the probabilistic argument. Right? <laughs> it's fun. Um, uh, I don't like it in the sense that I don't like most philosophical arguments. I don't think very many philosophical arguments work. Um, the idea of the subtraction argument is that we can, it, it, it is that the conclusion is that there could have been nothing, right? An empty universe is possible. And how do we see that? Well, the idea is that we, there could have been finitely many things. We can see that. Maybe there are finitely many things, right? Uh, concrete contingent things. There are finitely many particles in the universe. And then we recognize that for any one of these, it could have failed to exist. You know, there could have been one. This, this particle here might have ceased to exist. And um, its failure to exist wouldn't necessitate the existence of some other particle in its place, right? Um, so you can imagine a world with finitely many particles. You, then you can imagine a world that just contains one less part particle and rinse, wash, and repeat until you're imagining a world that contains no particles whatsoever. This is the empty world. Okay. Imagine a world in which there are no concrete beings. And the idea is that the subtractability of concrete objects gives us reason for thinking that there could have been none. Right. So that's the argument. So why don't you like it? Mm. 
Um, I know, I know you like it. Why doesn't it work? Well, I, I'm not sure that it's true that for that every being is such that it could have failed to exist. I think that there is, there are plausibly, there is plausibly a concrete being that um, had to exist, that couldn't have failed to exist. And I'd point here towards versions of cosmological arguments from contingency for that conclusion. I also think there are other ways that we can kind of get at the conclusion that um, there had to be something or other. I um, explore in one paper of mine, um, again, co-authored with Sam, um, the idea that modal theories, theories about what possibilities are, what is a possible, what kind of creature is a possibility, seems like a kind of wispy thing. And there are different ideas about what um, their possibilities are made of. And I look through different theories of possibilities, I consider different ideas of what possibilities are, and draw out the conclusion that on very many of these theories, on all the live pictures of what possibilities are, there is no possibility in which there's nothing at all. Well, possibilities is, in a sense, an abstract object, so that's not a concrete thing. Oh, that's controversial too, right? <laughs> uh, perhaps the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, David Lewis, took possibilities to be very concrete things. Right. Sure. Um, so our world is one alongside many other concrete worlds. I say there's a possibility of there being a pink duck in this room. What is that possibility? It's nothing less than being, there being a universe as full-blooded as our own. It's out there at no distance from ours, but out there in which there is a pink, oh, was it a purple? A pink duck in the room. Um, clearly on this view of possibilities, um, uh, if possibilities just are concrete things, then there's no possibility in which there's nothing concrete. But there are other more tame theories of what possibilities are, as you say, theories that take possibilities to be quite abstract things, in which it's harder to tease out this conclusion, to draw the conclusion that there had to be um, concrete things, some concrete things or other. So our work is cut out for us. Ty, I loved your paper, A Demonstration of the Causal Power of Absences. Explain it. Well, this is the paper without any words, um, <laughs> which I take to be an absence. Some people think that only positive stuff can have effects on the world. Only presences can are causally efficacious, um, not absences. Some people think that um, only actions can change the world, not emissions. Okay. The fact that Queen Elizabeth didn't water this um, plant behind me can't be responsible for its, its dying, that emission. Um, well, there, there, are, there are many philosophical questions about actions and emissions and what are these things. Um, my paper tried to show to the contrary that absences, these kinds of negative realities, can be causally efficacious. So just to be clear, you had the title of the, of the article, as I said, A Demonstration of the Causal Power of Absences, and then below that was just blank. Yeah, I, I wanted to do something even better in a subsequent book, but, you know, the uh, other authors and editors wouldn't allow me. I was hoping to have um, a title, a better demonstration of the causal powers of absences uh, in the table of contents without any page appearing. Um, maybe that would have been, I would like have been a better like demonstration, that. but like it's a that. mere possibility now. Well, I'm glad our possibility of speaking together has, has occurred. I've looked forward to this for a long time, certainly since both of our books were published together in 2013. Um, and I look forward to another conversation where we can, we can in-depth discuss more about nothing. There's much to do about nothing. Thank you for your time today.